What if I were to tell you that you've been ignoring something for all of your life? It was right around you and you just didn't notice it. It was right in front of your eyes. Would you be surprised? Think for a moment about what your reaction would be like. Would you be disappointed or perhaps surprised? Maybe the reaction would be so strong that it would prompt you to create something. This is actually what happened to me. It happened to me when I was looking at this sign, a simple street sign in my hometown of Haifa in Israel. So today we're going to talk about typography, written language, and actually what great impact it has on our interpersonal relationships, on our mindsets, and even about the change that we want to see in this world. And unlike the real story, let's start with the end in mind. So Arvrit is the project we're going to talk about today. And I've split it up to four stages. Just like this project was born, I'm imagining a tree. So we're going to compare it to a tree, starting with the context. And the context is, context is going to be the soil that we build this project upon. Later on, we have the concept, the thought, the idea behind this project. The, this hill on the tree of the tree starts from the context. The context is what it grows on. And then we've got the design part. The design part is like the trunk of the tree. This is the essence. This is the thing that has to be strong, well-structured, well-figured out, and well-executed. And only then we can go to the fourth part, which is the expansion of the project, where it's going, how it impacts people. And I'm comparing it to the branches and leaves and flowers and fruit that are growing very organically and ever changing on that tree. So starting with the context, this is Haifa. It's the city I was born at. This is where I'm actually uh, recording this to you today. And Haifa is in Israel and it's uh, one of the biggest cities and it's known as a multicultural city. So in this uh, Haifa uh, sign of the city, you can see Hebrew, you can see English and you can see Arabic. And this is what a lot of street signs and road signs in Israel look like. We've got Hebrew, we've got Arabic and we've got uh, Latin characters. So in this case, English on every single sign. Going back about eight years ago, I was walking down the street and I was just looking at this sign. It's important to say that my native tongue is Hebrew and I also studied English in school, but I never studied Arabic. Some people do study it, but in my school, they just didn't teach it. And it never really bothered me. I never thought there is a problem with this until I saw that sign. It was a random moment, but a moment that definitely changed my life. Let me show you how I was looking at this. So I was reading the Hebrew. I knew that the English is there, but I was ignoring the Arabic completely. Basically, I was ignoring a third of every sign that I've been seeing up to that moment. Since I didn't know how to read Arabic, the automatic system in our brain, the one which is responsible for reading, it kind of likes to reduce our mental load by just screening out irrelevant information. And Arabic was irrelevant for me. It was a set of incomprehensible letter forms and shapes, very beautiful. They looked like ornaments to me, but I've never paid attention to them as if they were letters with context and content and meaning. My brain just didn't notice them. But this sign was a symbol of something greater, more painful. It made me realize that the problem is not only in the sign, it's in my whole life. <laughs> it made me realize that this particular problem grows and grows and gets much bigger. 
Haifa, my, my city is known as a coexistence city. It's like a poster city for coexistence where Jews and Arabs are living side by side. Um, neighborhoods are, you know, uh, ne next to each other, dominated by beliefs and religion, and everyone is living very peacefully together. But in fact, that realization on that sign made me understand that we're not really living in coexistence, like I thought. We're living in parallel existence. I grew up in my own community, in my own, with my own friends, my own language, my own culture, my own scripts, and other, others, they were living in their own lives, were parallel, but not touching. I really felt the urge to do something and I didn't want my brain to ignore the Arabic any longer. I really wanted to make these parallel lines meet, but I had no idea how to. When I was thinking about the classic activist type, I just knew that I'm not that type. I'm not the type to go to rallies, to write raging posts on social media. So how can I say a message? How can I convey something that I've discovered? And it's going to change my life because there is no way back. And I knew I have to create something with my own tools. I'm a typeface designer by trade. So I design letter forms, I design fonts, and I had a feeling that by designing letter forms in some sort of way, I would be able to create something that will prevent me from ignoring the Arabic. So let's talk about the concept. To start with a very simple thing, I didn't want to ignore the Arabic, and I wanted to create something that will give the same respect on that sign to both Hebrew and the Arabic. I knew that this was my goal, but I had no idea how to approach it. And I started by researching the street signs. I was looking at how the type is set on them. And I was quite disappointed to see that there is almost no connection between them. Apart from the fact that they're set, you know, on top of each other or one next to another. There is not much relationship in the typefaces, in the styles, and even between them. They were just set on one single sign. I went to dive deep into historical research and I researched manuscripts. And though I, though I found that there are some similarities between Hebrew and Arabic, more linguistic, linguistic uh, semantics, like they were both semantic languages, they were both written from right to left, they were both traditionally written with the same writing tool of calligraphy, but when I was looking at them, the Hebrew and the Arabic, they're different in almost every sense. Arabic is flowing, it's curvy, it's connected, whereas he the Hebrew letters are written in a separate form. They're structured from straight lines and angles. They're a bit more stiff in their appearance. Is it even possible to connect the two? I began by drawing inspiration from the design world. I was looking at things that are cut and stitched together and examining the outcome each time. I was looking at architecture, jewelry design, fashion, and each time I was asking myself one question. What is the combination creating? Is the combination creating nothing whatsoever, just two objects that are meeting? Or maybe the combination is creating, actually causing harm creating each of the objects to lose their essence. What I was looking for is the third kind. I was looking for the places where the connection creates a hybrid, something new, areas where the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. This was quite challenging. I had no idea how I can progress with it. You can see it's a thing. And then I remember the work of louis Emil Javal, Louis-Emile Javal was, uh, Dr. Louis-Emile Javal was a 19th century ophthalmologist from France, and Javal discovered something quite interesting. He discovered that in order to read Latin letters, we basically need the top half of them. Our brain automatically completes the picture. Let's see if it works for you. Can you read it? 
So I was quite enthusiastic about this idea and wanted to see if it applies to Hebrew. It did not. <laughs> not at all, even. After being a bit discouraged and then trying some different, different directions, I was finding out that in Hebrew, actually, most of the identifying characteristics are on the bottom half of the letters. So when I'm looking at that bottom half, I can actually read. And I carried on to look at what's happening with the Arabic. If I'm looking at the bottom part of the Arabic letters, it's very difficult to read. But if I'm choosing the top part, the top half, this is where the essence of most of the letters exist. And I was happy. I was happy because I knew I have my system. I'm going to combine the Hebrew and the Arabic, and I'm going to each time dedicate half to the Arabic and half to the Hebrew. So the top part will be dedicated to Arabic, the bottom part to Hebrew. So if one wants to read Arabic, they will look at the top part. If one wants to read Hebrew, they will look at the bottom part. And then I started connecting the letters, creating hybrid letters that each of them was composed from a top part of an Arabic letter and the bottom part of a Hebrew letter. Let's see how it looks. So these are hybrid letters that are readable in two languages, Arabic on the top, Hebrew on the bottom, but they look like one word. So since, since most Hebrew and Arabic words are not using the same sounds and don't sound similar at all, I knew very early on that I have to design all the possible combinations. So if we're doing a quick math, that would come to 22 basic Hebrew characters with 29 uh, basic Arabic characters. So 29 by times tw uh, 22 is, came to the very small number of 638 new letters. But trust me, uh, as much as the project uh, progressed more and more, it was a lot more letters to design. I called this project Aravrit. It's a hybrid of the words Ivrit, Aravit, sorry, uh, meaning Arabic and Ivrit, meaning Hebrew. So basically, just like the letters and this hybrid writing system that I've created, the name is also hybrid, Aravrit. But there was one problem. Well, actually, there were many other problems, but there was one very big problem at that stage because, as I mentioned, I don't speak Arabic. So although I could technically connect the letters, I could kind of identify them. I didn't know if they were legible. And actually, I had no Arabic speaking friends to ask. So I started talking to strangers on the train, strangers whom I overheard speaking in Arabic. And I would approach them and ask if they can help me, showing them piles of test documents and pieces of paper with words in different stages, asking them if they can read it, testing this system and improving it. Although it was, it sounds very awkward, uh, it was actually quite fun because these spontaneous moments on the train, also joined by Hebrew speakers who jumped in and wanted to see what's happening, um, they were actually the first time in my life where these parallel lines of existence that I was mentioning before, they became coexistence. They started touching. So mathematically, it makes no sense, right? You cut something in half, and then you expect to create something bigger and more meaningful, and it seems impossible, but it works. So in Aravrit, one can read the language that they feel comfortable with, if it's Hebrew or Arabic, but still, they will not ignore the other script, which is always there, intertwined. And I've decided uh, on three pillars that Aravrit will be based upon. So the first one is, it's going to be authentic. I'm going to stay 
as loyal as I can to each script. I don't want to destroy the Hebrew. I don't want to destroy the Arabic. I want both of them to exist. So I'm going to stay authentic and loyal to the shapes and the forms and the styles. Then it has to be legible. It has to be read. The letters have to be identified. This was top priority for me. So remember this automatic system in our brain, the one that made me ignore the Arabic? So that same system doesn't let us not read something we can read. So this is what I based Arab Breton. Once something is recognizable, you can't ignore it. I wanted people to see that there is Hebrew there or see that there is Arabic there and just read. So actually this Arab Breton system used, uses this uh, automatic system in a very simple and functional way creating people to feel like they solved a little puzzle. So there's a lot of joy in discovering that you could read a word. The last pillar is that it's going to be effortless and it's going to be daily, which I believe letters are. Letters are such a daily thing. It's such one of the basic things we have in life, like food and water and communication. We see letters all around us. We don't really pay much attention to them, but once they're modified, people start paying attention. So let's talk about the, the trunk of the tree, the design part. Creating a Ravrit was not a cut and paste solution, although it would have been much simpler, but every letter, every pair, and every word are, desi every word are designed specifically. So sometimes the Hebrew will be more prominent, and sometimes the Arabic will be more prominent, staying loyal to the nature of the letters, each time ma maintaining the essence of each letter. So what we really have to have in order to identify it and the rest of the parts, they're compromising for this one new solution. And with time, the design got more sophisticated and much more loyal to the writing system. So if, I'm, if I started with the disconnected Arabic forms, I've been later moving on to connected forms. And actually, you know, the joint possibilities, where I'm connecting, how I'm connecting is basically endless. And since Aravrit is a writing system rather than font, there are enormous options for font styles and for typeface styles. They can be stiffer, they can be flowing, they can be light and curvy, and it's just an endless fun game, I would say. Some can be drawn from history, like these Yemenite-inspired letters. Some can be inspired by handwriting, such as the high school students did when they were writing in handwriting, Hebrew handwriting. And these interactions also create different things. And this is them writing and working on it. So using a whole different style. Lastly, let's talk about the expansion. Because once the project is done, basically, it can go into several different ways. And I've been asked this question, where are you going to take care of it? What's going to happen with it? And until I had this image of a tree and the branches, it was very hard for me to, to, uh, to answer this. So this new writing system that I've designed, Ravrit, was initially designed for myself. But quickly, Ravrit began to resonate with people. Social media can really accelerate grassroots movements, as we all know. And indeed, videos about this project became viral, accelerating the reach of this project far far beyond Israel, to places, even to places that Hebrew or Arabic are even spoken, like the Philippines, some places in India, Vienna, Brazil, Japan. I receive daily messages from people telling me that, you know, people from all around the world, that this project brings them hope and shifts their mindsets and even touches their hearts. I've gotten requests to speak and to present Aravrit and to actually show how global this project is. 
that just like my problem was far beyond the sign, that this project is far beyond Hebrew and Arabic. And just like the branches of a tree that are growing organically, I'm not even predetermining where it's going to go. I'm eager to find out. The leaves and the fruits, they're growing and the flowers are blooming and then they fall off. They nourish the ground, they nourish the, the soil. So they nourish the context and they keep on growing in new forms. Numerous people have been asking for Aravrit words for their tattoos. So marking this symbol as a subtle unity on themselves forever. Murals all around and graffiti started appearing on the walls, even some of them without my involvement. And what I've come to note is that kids and children are reading this very easily. This project was like born for children. They don't even pay attention that something is unique. They just read it very easily. Their brains are still flexible and they're growing up with the notion that there is Hebrew and that there is Arabic and that there is Arabic connecting the two. When I was collaborating with the president of Israel for a Ramadan blessing, we invited two children. We have Uriel from the first grade, a Hebrew native speaker, and Marianne, a native Arabic speaker from the first grade. And we asked them to color in the words which I've designed. As you can see, Marianne started with the blue, Uriel started with the, with the pink. But quickly, these sides didn't matter at all. Each of them just colored in like children should do. This was their goal. So blue and pink started blending. Green and red started entering this. And today, Ravrit is even taught in, uh, to Arabic speakers and to Hebrew speakers in school books and textbooks. But the interesting thing is that I'm even reaching with this project people that many times cannot read Hebrew and they cannot read Arabic. They're drawn to the novelty of the project and mainly they're drawn to the potential of it. So speaking of different scripts, I've also received numerous requests for testing it for other languages and scripts. And I'm very excited about this new phase. However, it will have to look different. It, the Arvrit system doesn't exactly work for other scripts. Other solutions have to be found. What you're seeing now is a collaboration I did with Kettle Company and the Paris Center for Peace and Innovation in Israel. So here, probably you can already identify how Arabic looks. And on the bottom, you can see how Hebrew and Latin are combined for the first time. It's like a different system, but there is a system and it is legible. So see if you can read it. People in Israel and later on around the world started asking for prints to hang in their homes and products to carry with them or wear. They're using them as conversation starters. What was really important for me is to produce, produce everything ethically, to know the people that I'm working with and to make it local in very, very, very small batches. By wearing Aravrit, people show their values and they show what they believe in without needing to say it out loud. And since not everyone who gets Arabic products can actually read both languages, every item comes with an explanation of how the combination is done exactly. What's Hebrew, what's Arabic, and how each word sounds. So you can actually learn by using them. And Ravrit aligns with everything that's daily. And this is how it got connected to Broadway's musical, The Band's Visit. This musical talks about um, connections created by ordinary people in mundane environment, just basic, very simple, very daily. 
the special connections that arises, and this fits so perfectly well with Arabic. I also have to share with you that this was the first time in the history of Broadway that an artist sold their things um, on the Broadway shop, an outside artist, so it was quite exciting. Let's hope shows will be back soon. Speaking of shows will be back soon, at the outbreak of COVID, I was feeling a lack of human touch, especially in Israel, we're so used to hugging and being close to each other. And it was a time that people wanted to hold on to people they love, but they couldn't. We couldn't. And there was this thing that we were all craving for. We were craving for giving hugs and getting hugs. And this is what made me design the word hug in Arabic. Chibuk in Hebrew, inak in Arabic. This t-shirt and the choice to put it on a t-shirt was also taking advantage of the day. Using a t-shirt is one of the basic things we can do just without much thought. You put a t-shirt on. So without thinking about it, you're just embracing human connections right now. The Arvrit message ex extends to our daily lives and what we need and what we're aspiring for. Arvrit restores trust to people. People who may not have been approaching you, connecting with you, talking to you. Now when they see that you're wearing something with Arvrit, holding something with Arvrit, talking about Arvrit, they know that they should come and that they can uh, start a conversation with you. When I was a little girl, we were all in Israel craving peace. We were drawing the word peace, which you can see here. We were drawing doves. We were hearing songs about peace. And peace really felt tangible. But then, after growing up, People around the country started kind of losing hope and peace became somehow of a word, somewhat of a word that makes us cringe and ignore and not wanting to ever say. But a few months ago, something changed. The Abraham Accords, so kind of a peace treaty was signed between Israel and the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. And this was a symbol and something positive that happened, which made everyone excited. And to celebrate this relationship, I've also designed the words to the tomorrow, a hopeful inspiration for all of us. And it's going to be presented in the Israeli pavilion in the World Expo in Dubai uh, very soon, in October or November. And another cross-culture project which I want to share with you is the Across Borders exhibition. We were paired designers and typographers and illustrated, illustrators, and I was lucky to have Jane Boyer, an illustrator from the UK, as my pick. We were both discussing what borders meant for both of us. We were, both of us were drawn, drawn to the words neighbor and to the word nature in relation to borders. We discussed that the permanent borders are actually man-made, not part of the natural world. And even the natural border between land and sea changes with the tides and basically changes daily. The natural world, in fact, is what connects us. We all experience the same seasons, the sun, the moon, the day, the night. So we've created this, this, um, this poster with the word connection in Arvrit. So uh, connection is surrounded by lots of uh, illustrated elements coming from nature. So here we had an opportunity to expand, to talk about the environment, to talk about refugees, to talk about our world by using Arvrit and illustration, by using connection to extend connection. We are aiming to challenge and question our choices and think about the world we want to live in, you know, for future generations. And this exhibition was displayed at the Design Museum in Barcelona, 
and shared all the typographic collaborations from other pairs of these designers, which you can see here. So I tried to think why Arvrit has such an effect. Arvrit is religion free. It's effortless. It's about people being able to speak about each other and eventually speaking to each other. It provides clarity and dialogue without falling to, into cliches, without planning how to insert a message or without trying too hard. Magic happens. I don't define myself as a political person and avoiding pol politics, honestly, in a project like this is quite hard, but I insist because using the tools of letters, which are daily and effortless, actually helps us cross this bridge. Someone can read who you are at the same time as they're reading who they are. The fact that all these people with different agendas can read it is a lot. It is a world of difference. Their backgrounds are irrelevant to the fact that in a single moment in time, they can read the same words and understand the same meaning. So let's end with opening the scope. That same takeaway that is true for our wit is true for our existence. We are here. We are joined together. Our lives are intertwined, whether we like it or not. Accepting this fact creates a change in mindset and then in reality. And there is a larger notion where we all come in, wherever we are in the world. In this day and age, the hybrid works. Let's stop doing apples and apples. <laughs> Why don't we do apples and oranges? If you're watching it, you have this, this presentation, you have the creative spirit in you. So here is the bottom line. And the suggestion, try it out. Take things and put them together. See where it gets you. You might arrive to something quite interesting. Thank you so much for your time.